Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank y'all. I want to welcome everyone out with us this morning. It's good to see see y'all out. We had a those that didn't make it last night missed a real good worship time and singing time. The men of faith, men of faith, four in Christ, which, four in Christ they always do a great job. Uh, they really do. It's a it's a it's a service in songs, and uh, we had a good crowd last night. Uh, really did had a good crowd and plenty of good food and and good worship time. But it's good to have y'all out with us this morning. I want to welcome each one of you. Want to welcome Bob's daddy with us this morning. Uh, I call him a visitor, but he's really part of the family. If you'll just get him out here more often, but uh, it's good to have him visiting with us this morning. It really is. And we got a lot of visitors over to the side this morning. Yeah. Uh, God. Well, they were here last, last Sunday. And so, uh, well, they, well, didn't he come with you last Sunday or did my mind? Okay, I know he was here last night. It's good to have him this morning with us, too. Uh, Katie's brother and wife. Good to have them with us this morning. Always good to have visitors with us. Uh, like for them to come be home, folks. Uh, I want to welcome you out. We have announcements this morning. Uh, we got a uh, men's meeting Monday night. Uh, all the men in the church are welcome to come. Uh, we usually have a little uh, talk of some sort and uh, some fellowship, and uh, we usually eat, have some food. So men in the church, we welcome to have you, and any visitors that want to come, you'll be welcome. Uh, the Method- Methodist women meet Tuesday night at 6.30. Uh, they have a meeting, fellowship as well, and... Uh, little something to eat and all, so, uh, and a speaker or either someone gives a program, and I'm sure they would enjoy having you come out with that. Bible study is uh, Wednesday at 6.30, choir practice is at 7.15. The Valentine's Supper is coming up. Uh, the men's club will pay for the single ladies. Families are asked to pay uh, $20 a couple for that. Uh, you need to let go ahead and let Bet and David know if you plan to attend so they will know how many chickens to buy at a barbecue. Uh, so we won't come up short. So either see Bet or David one if you can and as soon as possible and tell them whether you plan to be here or not. Uh, you found a little piece of paper in your bulletin this morning. Uh, I've talked to one of the possible revival pastors and um, before I even opened my mouth, he said the same thing I've said. You want a revival, 
He didn't put it this way, but this is the way I put it. You need to plow the ground and sow some fertilizer before you have the preacher. And then you can have a revival in the community. Uh, we need to do some work. So we're going to have some planning ahead of time. We had not set the date for the revival yet. We're going to see how the planning goes and how the outreach goes to that. You found in your bulletin this morning a little thing that has been used by other churches and it's been used successfully. There's six opportunities there to cut this up. Preferably give it to somebody in person and tell them we invite you to come to church. We'd love to have you. For those that can't get out, mail it to somebody you know. Send it in the mail along with a note and a card. Tell them we love them, God loves you. Uh, we'd love to have you come be with us. This is just one way to start reaching out. Like I said, if you're bashful and shy and can't feel like you can't talk, put it in an envelope, write a note. Tell them how much Wesley Church loves them, how much we like to have you part of our family. And let's start it with that way. We have a planning, planning committee meeting, not just those that are on that committee, but anybody who wants to come next Sunday at 2 o'clock here in the church, and we'll start working out some things we need to do and can do prior to having a revival. Uh, two o'clock next Sunday evening. It's not in the bulletin. Uh, Claude, don't get everything written down in the bulletin. His memory is not like it used to be. <laughs> Any other announcements this morning? Did I miss anything? All right. <coughs> If not, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we just give you the praise and the glory for the opportunity to be in your house. Lord, we just thank you for all those who've come out this morning. We, Lord, we pray that each heart that has come here would be blessed in some way today by something that, that, that I say or by something in the songs or by something that someone in the family here says to them this morning. We just pray that each heart would be touched, Lord, in some way today that you know it needs to be touched, whatever that way is, and that perhaps prayers would be answered today. Father, we pray for this service. We pray for not only those that are here, but we pray for those who are providentially hindered this morning, that you will watch over and keep them safe, Lord. We pray for the remainder of this service, that the things we say and do will be in accordance with your will and keeping with your word. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is number 143. 143 as we stand and sing. said be seated <coughs> I know we don't know that one and I, I know the choir problem I used to be in it they, from time to time they say why don't we learn something new right yep. so let's sing it again twice this will help us learn it
Amen. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. coming down now let's take a moment if we would and look at our prayer list this morning uh, last night I was asked to add Onessa Saxton to our prayer list uh, Blanche Butts having back surgery uh, Lit Woodard uh, is not doing well and Nancy Mills family uh, she passed away are the others this morning that we need to add to our prayer list 
or updates on those on our prayer list. Paul and Teresa, yes, always. They're on our prayer list right on, and uh, we need to keep them on our prayers, right? Uh, I was going to tell you, Benny is in a rest home in Snow Hill, uh, hoping temporarily. Uh, but Benny and Tiny both need our prayers this morning. Uh, they really do. Uh, so, and but he's on our on our prayer list. Yes. Um, Devin Moon was diagnosed with um, type one diabetes last week, so we need lots of prayer for our family to readjust to that. And that's who now? Devin Moon. Devin Moon. Okay. Diabetes. Yes. yes. Very much so. Thirteen. Thirteen. It needs to be added to our prayer list this morning. Keeping our prayers. Uh, I have a brother-in-law that's diabetic, so yeah, I understand. How about others this morning? All right, if there are no others, then let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and you've heard the needs that have been lifted up here, Father, for the ones that each family and each needs are individual. But Father, you know those, individual, those needs and those individuals. Uh, you know them uh, much better than we do, Father, and you know their needs better than we do, even better than the doctors. So, Lord, we come to you and we, we, we lift these individuals up to you and we pray for their needs. We put them in your hands, Lord, and ask for your mercy and your healing, for your love and kindness, Lord. We pray that you would guide the doctors and the caregivers involved with not only these, Lord, but all those on our prayer list. Uh, and the caregivers involved, Lord. We lift them up. We pray for the families that are involved with these individuals, Lord, for they too have needs. Father, we also pray not only for those that we are aware of this morning on our prayer list and the names that have been mentioned here, but Lord, we pray this morning for the country that we live in, for the world that we live in. We pray for the many needs that we, we face. Time here, Lord, wouldn't permit if we just sit down and name all those needs, but you are aware of them as, as well as we are, Lord. So Father, we pray for our country today. We pray for our world that we live in. We pray for our armed forces, our soldiers. We pray for our caregivers. We pray for those in our nursing homes, those that are homebound, uh, for the tragedies in this world, Lord, that we live in, the terrorists. We pray for the unspoken needs, Lord. Lord, we pray for this church. We pray that you would give this church the revival that it's now seeking, that you would touch each life and each heart, Lord, that you would urge and encourage each person to get out now, Lord, and do what we need to do to spread your word, to bring not only revival within this church, but revival to this community, Lord. It only takes a spark, Lord, just a spark to get a fire going. Lord, let us be that spark if it is thy will. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Can we have our ushers to come forward?
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of being in your house this morning. We pray, Lord, as we worship you, that we lift up your holy name. You said if we didn't praise your name, the rocks would cry out. And Lord, help us to praise your name and lift it up, because your name is worthy to be praised. Thank you, Lord, for this offering. I pray you bless it as we spread your word around the world and in our community. Help us, Father, to be obedient to your voice. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you would remain standing, take your hymnals and turn to page number 156. Have you meant that? Amen. All right, well, why aren't we getting out and telling it then? <laughs> Tell the story. That's what it's about. That's what a revival's about. Getting out and telling the story. Telling it to those we know over and over again. Hear it. Tell the story of God's love. And let's feel this church. We can do it. 
I believe it. If we pray and really truly want it. Tell that story. Great day in the morning. If we can just get them for Sunday school. And in the youth class. I mean. Trips. Trips and vans and going places and doing things. Come on down, folks. Come on down. What, what is that? Price is right. Come on down. The price is right. I don't know how to put the mics this morning. Y'all just going to sing loud and the guys back there just going to, just going to turn them up. I don't put them up down quiet where you can turn all four of them up, right? There you go. Fought the battle of Jericho. Okay, you guys know how Joshua fought that battle, right? Yes. Yeah. Right, not with swords. How did he do it, Jacob? With God. With God. Does anybody know how Joshua got into Jericho? What did they do? What did they do, Ansel? And they scattered around the city one time, and on the seventh day, they oh, they yeah. had to do it seven times, and. And the last time they blew their horns and shouted, and then the walls came down. They did. The walls came down. They were really, really loud, right? Yeah. So I'm going to ask Jacob and Ansel to come up here and come up and do it with us. So I want you guys to be really loud this morning when we sing, right? Because when we sing loud, it gives glory to God, okay? So let's and sing. then they turned the, the church down. Okay, yeah. We don't want to tear the church down. <laughs> don't be that loud, okay? And everybody clap, okay? Sing glory, hallelujah to the king. Celebrate, celebrate. Come and clap your hands and sing. Won't you join the celebration of the ruler of creation? Sing glory, hallelujah to the king. Amen. We did good. I reached back in the Old Testament this morning <coughs> to a time when Israel needed a revival. Uh, it's nothing new. I don't know why, but the people of God seem to go up and down. Uh, 
you look through history and it, the history of the church has been like this and I, I guess maybe when we get to the top we get complacent <laughs> uh, I'm not sure or maybe like Jeremiah which is where we're going to be at talk about day like Israel maybe we get caught up in the world that we live in uh, this is what happened to Israel and really and truly this is what I think has happened to the United States today and to England to Europe and to most of the world we're caught up in the things of the world and not only does this church need and want a revival but this country and this world is desperate not all of the world because like I said the Methodist church is growing in Africa China places where it's been depressed over the years it, we're growing by leaps and bounds by the hundreds thousands uh, the African continent now outstrips us in membership there was a time we sent missionaries over there and we way outstripped them uh, they're up and we're down uh, they haven't had time I don't think over there to get caught up in the things of the world the economy things Israel is in that, that same position in and out of history in the days of Jeremiah, in verses 1, chapter 1, verses 1 through 10, uh, uh, 4 through 10, actually, the Lord says, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, and to destroy, and to throw down to build and to plant the word of God for the people of God. <laughs> to me, as I read Jeremiah, these words today are the church's mandate again. This is the church's mandate. It's your mandate. It's mine. At the time that Jeremiah, the true worship of God had declined in Israel. And the people of God were in a bad way, physically, economically. Quite simply, they had lost their way. Israel had lost its way. Uh, they had come to depend on the government. Israel had depended on the kings, the great kings. To lead them and keep them safe and feed them and protect them and all the supply of their needs. And instead of things getting better, things are now getting worse. The people claim they want things made right. Sounds familiar. Listen to this and, and connect it with the, with the world we live in today. The people claim they want to make things right. But what most really wanted out of life in Israel was material things. That's what they were looking for. God said, you worship me with your mouth. But your heart is far from me. And they said, leave me alone with my spiritual life. Give me some more material stuff here. I'm hungry. I need clothes. I want a horse. I want a donkey. I want a camel. I want a sheep. Jeremiah lived in a country and a world I believe that was is very was was and is very much like ours today. If you read the history in Israel, if you go through this the Old Testament. Into this brokenness, God through Jeremiah offered Israel a way out, a future, built on grace and love and faithfulness. You see, these are the qualities of God. Gracious, 
grace, love, faithfulness. This is, this is God's qualities. Walter Bergman in his book, Hopeful Imagination, writes this. I believe that we are in a season of transition when we are watching the collapse of the world as we know it. God enters the broken. In God's attentive pain, healing happens. Newness comes. Possibilities are presented. If we turn back to God, this is what Jeremiah's <coughs> message was. This is what Bergman Jeremiah was living in a time that Israel was living in a broken world. The Babylonian Empire was on the move. They were conquering everything in its sight, overrunning it and ruling it. And the children of Israel are sitting here watching it with no great king. They're watching the Babylonians on the horizon as they develop their armies and move toward the little nation of Israel. Jeremiah was trying to tell the people of Israel that through it all, God remains faithful to the covenant that he's made with them. God remains faithful. He said, I will be your God and you will be my people. It's Israel that has not remained faithful. God has remained faithful. This is what Jeremiah preached to Israel long ago and it rings true today. God is saying to us, I will be your God and you will be my people. As I look around me at my country and realize how deep we have sunk from the 1950s in the last, just the last 50, 60 years. How far down we've come from serving God. Once before we had Billy Sunday and Billy Graham, Dwight L. Moody, other men and women, and churches that stood firm for the Word of God. Preachers that stood firm. Tommy Tyson, Key Taylor, the other Tyson boys, other pastors. They stood firm. And with the help of God and honest, heartfelt prayer, America in the last 50 years has flourished, I think, beyond its wildest dreams of anybody. Handheld phones that you can instantly talk to anybody anywhere in the world. God told Jeremiah that the time is coming, declares the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. Their time will come when they'll turn around. Jeremiah's not preaching doom in the end of Israel, but he's preaching hard times for Israel ahead. God says, if, if my people will, will turn back to me, if they'll reach out and come back, he says, I will put my instructions within them. I will engrave it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. But Israel must first do. Of course, and we know if we keep on, Israel did not. They didn't listen to Jeremiah. It will be years before they will come back to the, their land, the promised land. They'll face captivity and, and Israel will... Won't even be what we would call a third or fourth world country during that period of time because Babylonians will leave only the uneducated behind in Israel. The very poor. They won't bother to carry them off. Everybody else is carried back to Babylon. The tradesmen, the educated men are all removed. I pray that this is the time for Wesley Church to, to, to do what it says it wants to do, to turn around, to, to become a revival church. I pray that I'll see y'all rise up. You say we're small in number. Israel was small in number. Jeremiah was only one. 
rise up and be a light not just to this community but who knows if one community catches a fire I tell you fire has a tendency to spread like wildfire so will the word of God if you truly catch on fire for God it remains for us to to, to, to listen to what Jeremiah has said. True revival for this country has got to start somewhere. It's got to start somewhere. Israel had drifted from God. The people were caught up in trying to make a living. You read the book of Jeremiah and, and you, 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 you can transfer that history right into us. Israel was more interested in trying to make a living. Who's going to be the next king, the next ruler, the next president that's going to give us prosperity, more prosperity than we had in the years past? This is what Israel was looking for. The next great king to give them more material things. Israel had drifted from God. They were caught up in, in trying to make a living in, in the turmoil of their day. If you read the Old Testament and the Bible, it's a history of the world over and over and over repeated as it turns from God and comes back to God. That's what it is. A history of, of when the world turns to God, a nation turns to God, and a nation drifts away from God and then, has, then comes back to God. God is patient, loving, and kind, and He works with us. In order for revival... In order for Israel to survive economically, it first has to come back spiritually. I honestly believe if this country continues on the road that it is on, it will fall economically. It will totally crash. The depression will be worse than the last one we had. Now, I'm not talking about the one I remember, but I'm talking about the one maybe Mark and back then a few others remember. Computers go silent. The things that's driving and the main grid, as they say, goes down, and this world, this country will come to a screeching halt. Economically and otherwise. Even cars out there now. If the main computers that running all these computers drops, I can't even crank my car up. Got no way to hand crank it. And it won't start without this little thing in my pocket to mash the button to tell the computer to start it. This is how dependent we're becoming on mechanical things and how fragile, how fragile we have become as a nation. Stock market can fall in China and if it truly crashes, the whole world will crash. Think about this. Where are we at? We're on a precipice. The world, the world has, has come to the edge of the cliff again. And if Jeremiah was here this morning, he could preach it better than I can. Until a nation as a people put God back into the equation, things might seem to improve short times off and on, but in the long run, without God, without morality, this world is going to get worse and worse. A cigarette smoking and a can of beer was the worst things I had to worry about growing up. My God, look at it out there now. Look at our young people. Look at... And, and look... Ball games... And Bet says I shouldn't go there. But anyway, I am because this is the way I feel about it. I'm going to tell you the truth. Thousands of people spend six, seven thousand dollars for a seat in a ball game and won't go to church. I call it Caesar's gladiators. That's what Rome did to entertain the poor to keep them from uprising is they entertained them with the gladiator games. That's what they were built for, really, to keep the poor entertained so that they wouldn't rise up, keep their minds off the problem. Caesar passed out free bread. You went to the gladiator games, you got free bread. And look at the Colosseum that they built. It seated thousands. It was to keep them from rising up. And it crashed, didn't it? Until we as a nation and people put God back into the equation, things are not going to improve. They are not. It's going to get worse. 
all we can do and all that is asked of you is to make sure that we are standing up for God and Jesus and what the scripture says and the key word right here is in pray honestly pray I won't ask you what's the first thing you do when you get up in the morning I tell you what I do I pray That's the first thing I do. I turn my dog out, and while the dog's out and having a good time, I sit down in the quiet of the darkness and pray while he runs all over the yard. And then I pray during the day. I've told you before, I pray. I pray all during the day. Everybody should do this. You ain't got to get down on your knees to pray. I can say a quick prayer up here in this pulpit and do. <laughs> I mean, this is, what we, this is what's missing in America. The morale is, the moral, morals have gone. You know, Keith Taylor said that this church was once the smallest of seeds that became a tree. It can do it again. The size of this church has nothing to do with revival. Nothing at all. The size... God can take one person. He used people like Billy Graham and Dwight L. Moody and they turned tycoons around. Back, people that were rich back then to God. Came back to their knees. And look, look where the country it flourished. Economically as well as spiritually. I don't know, maybe y'all don't believe the world's broken right now. Maybe you think it's in great shape. Am I the only one? No. <laughs> right. Look at, look at, more television shows than ever before. And I tell you, I can't hardly find one on that that is fitting for me to watch unless it was made in 1940 or 1950. <laughs> that I'll even spend time to watch it because of the filth that it teaches. In your bulletin today, You have a thing to hand out. Uh, I had a cousin in a Baptist church that has a large, large church, very large church. He passed out more of those little slips of paper I was told by his pastor than anybody in the congregation. He told me one time, said, ain't nobody or nothing going to stand in my way of passing out the word of God. You go talk to him, he hands you one of them. In his business or anywhere else. If he was talking business with you, he, he'd reach in his pocket and hand you one. <laughs> if you didn't like it, that's too bad. He didn't care. <laughs> hand it to you anyway. If you throw it in the trash can, that, that was your business, but he'd give it to you. President John Adams said this of our Constitution. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to a government of any other. Do you hear that? Now that, I believe those were God heartfelt words. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to a government of any other. John Adams. And look at the mess that the government spews out right now. And how they override and go past the Constitution. They, 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 all they care about is how, can I look for a way to get around this law or that law or get under this one or over that one. church needs to get rid of its political correctness where we're told to keep our mouth shut in certain places and not say something or not do something you need to get over it
This has to become a Christian nation again if it wants to be a great nation again. It will not. The road it's on is a downhill road. I've watched it over the last five years get darker and darker. The churches once again have got to wake up and begin with a revival, begin, begin with outreach. At least be a, like Jeremiah and warn the people what's coming. It's because it's coming. It's coming. We're supposed to be outreached. Matthew 5, 14, Jesus said, we are the light of the world. Listen to this. We are the light of this world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. The church is failing to be the light of the world right now. We've sat back and quietly let them hush us up. Don't talk about this. Don't say that. We don't want to hear that. You shouldn't say this here. You can't say that there. That's bull. We are the light of the world, Jesus said. That's what we're to be. But if this light goes out, the world's going to be in darkness. If you believe what Jesus said, if you believe him, and this light goes out, it's flickering. If it goes out, this world's going to be in darkness. And I can tell you what, what darkness brings on. <laughs> Things we don't even want to talk about. It's time for us to wear our Christianity on our shirt sleeves. Someone said, well, I don't wear my Christianity on my shirt sleeve. I wear mine on my coat sleeve. If mine's on my shirt sleeve and on my arm too, if you want to know it. In my heart and in my mouth too. <laughs> Whosoever, Matthew 12, 32, and whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world nor the world to come. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and the fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by its fruit. Matthew 12, 32, 33. You want things to change, I do. That change has to start with us. It has to start with you and it has to start with me and it has to start with our actions and our priorities and it has to start in prayer. I don't want nobody to raise their hand because I won't embarrass nobody. What's the most important thing for you Monday morning? The night. Is it TV? Work? Just sitting home? Looking at your financial situation. You fill in the blank. What's the most important thing to you right now? If you want a revival, it needs to be doing God's will. That needs to be number one on your priority list. The most important thing in your life from this moment forward needs to be to do the will of God as best as you possibly can and do it in prayer. Don't worry about what anybody else says. Forget it. Ball games, what's important? I can tell a person by listening to them talk, tell what's important to them. I can tell you right off quick where they are. What's the most important thing to them? It don't take me long to know. Jeremiah and I asked this morning, Jeremiah asked the people, search your hearts this morning. Answer the question, where are your priorities, Israel? Where are your priorities, church? Jeremiah told the children of Israel of their impending doom and they failed to listen. And their physical world was destroyed. Jeremiah preached, preached his heart out. Okay? Wouldn't turn back. But at least Jeremiah is in heaven. He did what he, he, did what he was asked to do. I ain't worried about where Jeremiah's at. Paul and Barnabas faced the same problems in their day and time. We're no different from the rest of the world. This happens every so many years. The church comes to one of these wedges, points, roadblocks. And it does one of two things. It picks itself up and faces the situation head on with the help of God. 
and wins or it knuckles <coughs> under and that particular civilization falls as it's known it crashes read the history books you ain't got to read the Bible read the history books they tell the same story Second World War, Korea, right on back. They tell that story, what, what happens when nations shun God. Paul and Barnabas faced these same problems. Revival has to start before the preacher gets in, folks. In a deep inner desire to put God first in your life. Above everything else. Jeremiah 31 3 the Lord appeared to appeared to us in the past saying I have loved you with an everlasting love I have drawn you with loving kindness everybody here in this church has heard the word of God and Jesus warns us and you as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire so shall it be at the end of this world so shall it be at the end of the world that the angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from the God himself predicts when the church truly fails worldwide and it's not worldwide right now it's basically in the countries that are economically well off but when the church fails worldwide the end will come you won't know when the end will come when the church fails worldwide that's what he's saying when there's no more when it can't reach out We're not there in this world, but America is. I believe with all my heart, America is standing, if not at the crossroads, close to the crossroads. When the church had better stand up and fight for its life, or you look around you at the age in here, or when the church will soon be no more, and when that happens, you can bet your last nickel the end is close. I want you to answer in your heart this morning. Are you willing to do what's needed to help try to turn things around? Not only in this church, but in this community, in this world. Are you willing to start reading your Bible every day? Blow the dust off of it, go find it wherever it's at, get whatever's on it off, pull it off the shelf out and under the table or out in the closet wherever you got it and open it up and read it. Will you pray for revival here? Pray for me. If you ain't got anything else to pray for, love of God, pray for me. I can use all the prayer I can get. But pray for not only for you but for the church. Not just this church but the church at large. Pray for this church. If you want revival to start, let it start right now. If we truly need it, and we need it, God knows we need it. If we truly want it, and we follow God's instructions, I believe with all my heart we'll have it. Hebrew 13 5 keep your lives free from the love putting it first in your life what you love you put first in your life whatever it is you love you put first in your life keep your hearts free from the love don't say not get money to live off of it says the love of money be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. If you have him, you In other words, put me, God says, put me first. Put me first in your life. And that don't mean one day a week or one hour out of that one day a week. 
it means Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Revival starts with us, folks. We are God's chosen people. You're God's chosen. Those of you that have been saved, come to the altar and ask Him to come in your You're God's chosen people. And the Lord says, if my people, if my people will seek me, will seek my name, will call on me, will pray and meditate, if my people will do what they're supposed to be doing, I will answer their prayers and pour out a blessing on them. That nothing made down here will hold it. Amen. The altar's open as we stand and sing our closing hymn. Number 158. 158. Brother Bob, how about you dismiss us, please? Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you with bowed heads and humble hearts, wanting to give thanks for this bright, warm, sunshine today, and for yet another opportunity to be in your house and worship with you in fellowship, song, and praise. We thank you, Lord, for your presence here among us. We ask you to bless all the members of our congregation, both those present and those absent. And we ask your blessings on the pastor for the wonderful message that he preached to us this morning. Help it to be food for our souls. And help us to think and ponder on the message throughout the work week as we leave here. Help us to start a revival by beginning to renew our priority of having you lead our lives. We ask that you bless the sick and the shut-ins and protect us from the arrow that flies by night. In all these things, in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.